welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Jessica with Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast, and we are welcoming back this author who uh, writes some pretty twisted books. The last book that we talked to her about was If I Disappear, and now uh, the book that we are talking to her about is Good Rich People. So uh, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your book. Hi, I am Eliza Jane Brazier. Um, and Good Rich People, it's kind of like, you know, it's a thriller, but it's sort of like a black comedy. And it's just sort of like a take on um, like wealth disparity in America. Like it's sort of I could compare it to sort of like Parasite meets like Ready or Not, like maybe a little bit of Knives Out. Like it's just this sort of completely crazy um, take on, you know, poverty and wealth in Los Angeles in America. <laughs> so the main character, Lila, is married to this very wealthy person. She doesn't come from wealth. Oh, and by the way, there's blood in a fountain uh, in the beginning of the book. That's not a spoiler. That is literally how the book begins. How the blood got in the fountain, um, that is part of the journey. Uh, so Lila is um, married, you know, to this very wealthy man. You find out that her mother-in-law, Margot lives on their property so that's fun um yeah yeah. (laughs) and um you like just the whole the whole meeting her after the whole blood in the fountain incident which you find out happens at a different point in time uh is interesting because like she's going shopping and she's complaining that the food isn't expensive enough at the supermarket where where did that cut do you know like is this a thing that actually happens <laughs> I feel like it kind of is no I mean honestly so when I wrote this book like I was living in Los Angeles um and this is kind of like even what you sort of I guess like hearken to in talking about the mom like living on the property is this kind of idea of like these like tiers of wealth so even though they're uh, Lila and Graham are very wealthy like they're sort of beholden to people who are even more wealthy. So it's like their mom, the mom has like all the money. So she has this huge house that's kind of like looking down on them. They have this guest house that they invite people to live in. So there's all these sort of different levels of wealth. Um, And then, yeah, just like, I guess, so I have, when I was living in London, I lived like below the poverty line for like seven years. The whole time I was there, me and my husband, like he was basically on like benefits from the government. I mean, I, and I wasn't entitled to them because I was an American, but we, you know, lived kind of very, it was like a massive, like, you know, sort of struggle. We had people living with us who were homeless, who would stay with us for sometimes like years. Um, But because my husband was a musician, he would also sometimes like, we'd get invited to these crazy parties where he would like play, you know, perform or whatever. And so we'd go to these houses where like there would be like fine art, literally like collaged on the walls because there wasn't enough room on the wall for like how much art they had. Or like there was this one house that I went to and I kind of like almost referenced this in the book. And in the kitchen, every single cupboard was filled with like Moe champagne, like the fridge like all the cupboards like there was no food there was just like moe and it was just like this yeah (laughs) I was actually you know what I had a note to myself and usually I'm kind of a freewheeler when it comes to these interviews like I'll be like yeah I I know what I'm going to touch on but like one big note was what's with the moe because moe shows up constantly in this Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, it was like kind of like just like, I guess, like almost like a personal like joke in a way, because this like, we went to this house, it was like, it was a penthouse that was it was somebody super famous, I won't say who it was, but like, um, it was this penthouse that was like spread over two floors, like looking out over the park in England, and it was like, 
all moe. And I remember I like walked into this house and it was like the sort of like living room was like the lobby of like a Vegas hotel. And I was like, what the, like, it's just so crazy. Um, and we were like coming in, like, we didn't even have like, we didn't have like a washing machine. Like we wash our clothes in the bath. Like some of our clothes were like basically stolen or like, you know, you like find on the side of the road and you're like walking into these houses. And so like that kind of fueled a lot of, um, a lot of it. And then I think there's also like a certain degree of like Englishness because I did live in England for so long, like with the whole Moe thing, it's like almost like how they treat like having like, let's have tea. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, let's have Moe, but like everyone hates it. <laughs> it, was, like, it was so funny. It. I mean, it might be a personal joke, but it was, it was really effective within the context of the book every time it came up it was like oh moe again here we go uh so but yeah so lila and her husband graham so lila does not come from money and graham comes from margo which means he comes from money and he makes a salary on his own but margo is just wealthy and um they have like this little apartment that they claim they rent out to help the people but there's something more sinister in it and you find out you know Lila um has had history connecting with some of the tenants before and there's just like a few different players that sort of come in and out of the book um but then there's also um Demi who is supposed to be their next uh tenant but that story has its own nuances to it. Uh, yeah. Man. It's very complicated, right? To like explain, like, cause it's like the way that it works is it's like a dual POV. So it goes from, it'll show like Lila's kind of perspective and then it will show like Demi's story. And you almost don't know, like, how are these going to connect? And then they kind of do like again and again in like more sort of twisted ways. <laughs> Yeah, there there were just like, there were so many moments. And I really do. I mean, it's funny, because I really do see it as like a black comedy, a dark comedy, a little bit even more so than a thriller, not that the thriller aspect wasn't there. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to shy anybody away from this being like, okay, this is definitely a thriller. But there's humor in it. That was just delicious. And you did that very well also in um, If I Disappear, I thought, as well. But the stories are quite are very much quite, um, quite different. Um, how was writing this one a little bit different than the last one? Um, you know, to be honest, it was, it was like, it was very like complicated, I think in a way how it unfolded. So initially I, like I said, because of my own sort of personal experiences, um, like going through like extended periods of really not having money and like a very intense and like, t like kind of, you know, you, you're sort of subjected to a lot of trauma. And so initially when I was writing this story, like it was hugely like therapeutic, like when, like when I, like all the sort of stuff from Demi's backstory is like a sort of fictionalized version of things that like really happened to me. Like, but it's sort of, you know, it's her father and where it was like my husband. Um, so initially, like I'm writing this book and it was like depressing. It was not a comedy. It was very depressing. And it was like super, like it was during lockdown that I'm writing this I, and it's bringing up the thing is when you start, I don't think about that stuff a lot because it's it's it can be like very upsetting because you get kind of mad and you feel like, you know, it wasn't like things, certain things weren't fair or things, obviously like people like my husband is, has died. Some of our friends have died, things like that. So yeah, like it was just like this really like emotional and like horrible, you know, horrible kind of experience almost in a way, but I think it was good in, in the long run. But so the books that I was creating and like sending to my editor were like really depressing and almost like maybe like too personal and it just wasn't really working. Um, and so kind of, okay, funny story. Like at that time I was living in a duplex in LA, like in the Hollywood Hills, kind of similar to what is like in the book, but obviously not as fancy. <laughs> um, and the people who were living upstairs, one of them was the director of the movie ready or not. And he went away to go film something else. And I'd never seen the movie. And I was like, oh, they're away. So, cause they can hear me. They could hear me through their floor. Cause I was literally underneath them. Um, 
And I was like, I'm going to watch this movie now that they're gone because he won't be able to hear me watching it because I was like afraid to watch it before because I was like, what if they like here? And so I watched that movie and I was like, oh my gosh, like that's what I need. Like that is so like simple the way that it's constructed because it's like, you know, it's a game. It's going to like end by tonight or sorry, the next day. And this is what you have to accomplish. And it's like, everything was so straightforward. And so I was like, dude, that's like what I need. So I said to my editor, I think we had like a month before the book was like the final deadline. And I said, you know what? I don't really like how this is going. I want to do it this way. And I like wrote just the pitch, the idea of like these um, wealthy people playing a game with their tenants. And I was like, what do you think? And she was like, yeah, go for it. (laughs) So I literally like, it was this time of year last year. And I literally like in five weeks, like rewrote the entire book. And I think because I was writing it so fast, like I'm a very like, even though I sound probably dark in this interview, I'm actually like a very like comedic person. Like I probably would do better at comedy than thrillers in a way. So I was just kind of like writing the way that I, you know, sort of the way that I think like my sense of humor, like my kind of, I don't know, like dark observational sense of humor. Uh, Yeah. And I just rewrote the whole thing super fast and had a completely different book and it, it worked. And I was like, Oh my gosh, thank goodness. Cause like, it, for it the whole did, year, it did for- work. And there's like, you know, with the title, because I think the last time I spoke to you, I think you mentioned the title was good rich people or unless the title changed. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe possibly. Yeah. I, I have to, I have to go back and like, be like, Oh, I'm going to listen to you if I disappear again. But anyway, I, I digress uh, because I was like, Oh, that is kind of a funny title. Like you could tell there's sarcasm in it. Yeah. And um, you know, a little, a little bit of um, interesting um, just like my current reading, I'm getting ready to, um, to do an interview with um the author of um, Beautiful Little Fools, which is another take on gr- The Great Gatsby, which is another book about wealth. Uh, oh. And I really liked it. Uh, but like just when you're talking about, you know, well, there's different tiers of wealth. The, it, it was making me think of just like, you know, like the, these rich people who look down on these yeah. rich people. Um, and there, there were things in your book that were very funny, but also really depressing. Like there's like a part where Lila's looking at dip and she's just like, oh, she looks fabulous. She's got this weight thing going. And it's oh, like, yeah. yeah, the reason she has this weight thing going is not for a good reason. And it's again, not something I want to give away, but you know, because, uh, one thing that that was interesting was, you know, Lila's at odds with Margot because she doesn't seem to be into this game the way that Graham and Margot are. Um, they pick Demi to be the um, the tenant, but Demi doesn't seem to come from less so much as the others weight wise, because I, I want people to kind of get into that. Uh, so, so, yeah, so she's looking at her and she's just like, oh, man, she's so attractive with her body being, you know, like this toothpick body. And when you're reading it from Demi's point of view, you're like, oh, my gosh, no, this is not why yeah thin. this is this isn't like a stylistic choice yeah and it does touch on I think an interesting I think kind of point that I was sort of trying to make is that how everyone you know like so Graham is like one of the most wealthy people in the book right but he is like he wants to almost like wants to be poor you know like he's yeah. sort of like obsessed with it fascinated by it like he feels like it's like and it's this kind of whole idea that you can't really ever sort of I guess, have, have it all. And it's like, even, you know, uh, or there's a point where I talk about how like wealthy people, like they want everything. They even want your sympathy. Like they want you to feel bad for them. They want to be struggling too. And it's like, you know, this kind of whole sort of ridiculous thing where it's like, everyone wants what the other person has, you know, even when it's not necessarily justified, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's, and there is like this whole, and I'm not going to say, that, you know, there aren't people with wealth that do set out to help people, but there's also sort of almost like, um, I I suppose, you know, you you hear about these quote unquote charity funds and charity parties, 
But, you know, like, is the money that's being raised really going to help the people they claim? Yeah. Is this an excuse to throw a party without feeling guilty about the fact that you have all this money? I mean, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of talk about about that, you know, like, why don't you just why don't you just raise the money and get, you know, like, is the benefit really a benefit? Um, and yeah. The, the idea that, you know, like, they're like, oh, we have, we have this small place under, you know, it's like, it, and it's a depressing sounding apartment, by the way. Uh, this is know. my real apartment. It was depressing. Oh I mean, my gosh. It, was, it was the nicest place. That was the other thing is when I was living there. And that was kind of what inspired, uh, part of what inspired the book. It was the nicest place I had ever lived. It had a bedroom, like a one bedroom. I never had that before, but it was dark, like, because it was underneath somebody else's apartment. Or, or a house, like, so it's a duplex. And I call it apartment. I was like, cause it, cause I guess it was kind of like one, but it only had like little tiny glass windows looking out into literally trees. And it was the nicest place that I had ever lived. But I, so at that time I was working with someone in Hollywood who was very successful and we couldn't meet for some reason where we were supposed to meet. So I was like, Oh, come to my house. He came to my house and he was so rude. Like he was just like, this place is dark. It's cool. Oh. It's weird, which, okay, fine. It was, but like to me, it was just so weird. Cause to me, I was like, this is literally the nicest place I've ever lived. You know what I mean? And it just kind of made me realize like how, I guess, like, like what we're saying, like how many different, like sort of like tears there are and like how people, I guess they don't really because of the experiences that I've had, like I see things way different. So even like the house I live in now, I'm like, this is like insane. But like, if somebody else came here, they'd be like, all they see is like, you need to redo the kitchen. You need to like, you know, change the carpets and like the seal, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's just crazy. It's just everyone's, I guess, experience dictates how they sort of view the world. But yeah, it was kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you and you mentioned you mentioned Parasite, which was great, and you know that also has a very interesting apartment that exists in Korea. Those apartments are an actual thing. Yeah. Um, so again, that's that's another thing. It's like you know you you think that that you think that something is um, too ridiculous or too dark or too out there to really exist but the truth is usually sometimes just as strange as fiction yeah totally um so man I loved this book so much um so some of the other things in it um Lila herself was sort of this really interesting mercurial character there were times I felt sympathy for her. And then there were times I was like, oh, no, honey, you are part of this. You want to divorce yourself from what Margot and Graham are doing, but you are buying into it. Um, that whole that whole aspect to her. Um, did you do you do you see did you see that a lot in people? I mean, I think that what I was kind of, and I think I probably, I sort of talk about this in the book, but I think that what I was kind of trying to sort of talk about is just like complicity, because I think that, you know, this is like, in a way it can be, I mean, it's a fun and entertaining book, but I think it can also kind of be in a way it's it's a challenging book because I think that I wanted to sort of encourage people to look at all the ways in which we are all sort of complicit So I think for her, it's like she sees herself as being separate because she says, well, I don't enjoy this game. Like they're, they're doing it. I don't play it. They're doing, they're just playing it. I'm just like, you know, living here and I'm kind of innocent because I'm not doing anything really. She literally like barely does anything. She hates her friends, but she kind of like, she she doesn't even even like with, and with like the cooking thing, it's like, it was, again, it was so funny. Like she's walking into the supermarket in the beginning. She's like, I can't pay for this sauce. It's not expensive enough yeah and you know like yeah she doesn't do anything she doesn't she doesn't cook she just but like not that she not that she should as a woman but really like I I don't know so she hires this woman who just kind of walks up to her in the supermarket and is like oh I can help you I can cook you know just no questions asked like fine you can come and you can cook for me it it was just so crazy and yet I feel like that's totally something that would happen 
Yeah. I mean, I feel like in the context of the story, it, kind, it, it makes, sort of makes sense just because it's like, if she doesn't get someone, then, then Margo will. And I think in a way that she's sort of, basically she's been sort of trapped by this man that maybe she's in love with, maybe she's just in love with his money. She doesn't really know, but she's definitely, she definitely is like, like I, I, I had a lot of conversations with people um, who are interested in adapting this, like for like TV or film or whatever. And this one guy made this point that I was like, actually surprised by. And he was like, oh, she just wants to be loved. I think Lila just wants to be loved. And I was like, oh my God. You didn't what? Write what? <laughs> but I was like you're kind of like I kind of get what you're saying because he was like Margo's so it's so weird how different people see it differently he's like Margo's so mean to her Graham's so mean to her and I think she's kind of just been really like beaten down in a way as a person because she's like with this guy who's a complete like I don't know blank you know like a complete like really scary almost predator yeah and there's there's a lot there's a lot about <laughs> <laughs> Ram, I don't want to say because it unfolded really nicely throughout the book. Yeah. And you think you're like, okay, you know, you think you know what he's all about. And then you're just like, oh. And then like a few chapters later, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good description. Should put that on the back. <laughs> yeah that's that's the blur of like you know again, you think you know but oh and then oh and then, and then oh, like, oh, oh, oh. Like, like that little like gif in it where she's like mm, mm. <laughs> yeah and then you know there's also the incident that um is described in the beginning of the book and then it ties to lila mm -hmm as well and that's sort of another undertone that's woven really nicely into the book involving um a relationship she had with um a former tenant which i guess i can kind of see what the guy was saying um through that if that is the case i mean if there are any redeeming qualities lila had had at any point it might have it might have been shown through yeah. possibly at one point in that but maybe not so much yeah the resolution yeah um, yeah I mean I guess there's like kind of an idea that um my that you know people want a human connection and nobody really has it um except for Lila like sort of maybe had it in the past and then there's also kind of like this inkling that maybe her and Demi could have like a sort of genuine human connection you know yeah uh, so this was, this book was great. This was great. Are you, so will there be an adaptation? Because I felt like oh, this for was sure. well, so I mean, cinematic. Sure we made, but like we had, okay. So like, I mean, I'm not, you're not allowed to talk about the specifics, which is so annoying, but no, so it no really, specifics here. <laughs> yeah, but it was really cool. So, cause with this book, I actually had like a major production company, which I wish I could say, um, reach out to me before we even took it out, which is really interesting because it's like, they get like copies, like they like sneak copies. They have like little, I don't know, little uh, insiders or something. So they were, they wanted to like make an offer on it. And then my agent was like, okay, well, let's take it to some other people too. And so I, I spoke to like a lot of people, this was over the past like couple of months. And like, I spoke to like the coolest companies. Like I literally spoke to like companies of people who I've like admired since I was like a child so it was really cool like I mean so so we I mean I think we have chosen one and we're just in the final stages of negotiations and stuff but like that was like the coolest thing and it was also super interesting because I mean I guess with this book I would say people were more on the same page but everyone kind of does have like a little bit of a different take you know like I said that one guy really thought like really connected to Lila, which nobody ever connects to Lila. I, I certainly did not connect <laughs> to Lila. I will say that. I know it's kind of a little bit telling, right? When someone does, you're like, hmm. Um, yeah. And just, it's just fun to talk about though. It's cool. You know, just like different like ideas and like, I want, I want to do it as a TV show because I think it'd be really cool to like do another season. I, I think it's, so I think TV. I don't want to do spoil. Yeah. Have but really I would revolutionize the the whole idea of adaptations you know like there's all this um the book was better when it comes to movies and for the most part I agree that you know but then at the same time like sometimes movies have like something you know are able to portray something different but the thing about a tv show is you get like 
episodes to play in the sandbox wow. and draw it out and maybe like express nuances that were in the yeah. book, but in a different way. And I think that like, I just absolutely love the this golden age of television and book, yeah. you know. Same. That's the thing is that's like, for me, that's like the reason I want to do it is like you said, like, because TV is so great right now. And I also heard like a description, which I think is kind of um, also apt is that like, you know, TV shows are about like characters. And so you get a chance to like really dive into the characters and like, it's, it's, it's a lot more like real life which I think as an author is kind of like compelling because like a film you don't have time and and everyone changes which that rarely happens in real life whereas with a tv show you got a lot of time and people don't change (laughs) yeah (laughs) like you think they're gonna but they don't and I feel like it's kind of more like you can kind of more play with like the way that real life is which is kind of fun to me well I'm excited um and Aside from that, do you have another twisted book coming out anytime soon? Well, I don't know how soon it is because I think they're like moving stuff around. I think they might be moving me into the summer, but I'm working on, I mean, I guess I'm allowed to talk about it. So I will, huh? Um, (laughs) This is okay. So this is like the thing, right? So I feel like if I disappear was like a mystery, this one was like kind of like a black comedy, right? My next one is maybe like a romance, but obviously it's like a little bit twisted, but it's, so it takes place. So I used to teach horseback riding um for like really sort of I guess like quite wealthy people in um in Southern California and that's what I was doing when I sold if I disappear and like through that experience like I worked with a lot of you know these really sort of wealthy mothers who were kind of pushing their kids into riding and so I wanted to do like a book that was kind of based in the world like kind of in a Megan Abbott kind of way but obviously not Megan Abbott because I'm not that I am not that good but um like sort of like a Megan Abbott meets like Leanne Moriarty like it's like mothers and daughters in this sort of like show jumping world in Southern California um yeah and it's just like it sort of like starts with like a you know a death at a horse show and it kind of like goes from that and and it's like romance and you know drama and it's just like it's cool like it's fun it's um instead of it being like in first person it's like third third person I guess like omniscient has goes through like all the different characters it's almost like a tv show you know because it'll like and similar to to this book it's like it kind of like pivots like depending on who it's talking about um but it's super fun yeah it's like a big soap opera I guess very exciting well definitely come back when that comes out and (laughs) um I will be thinking in my mind who who should be cast as Lila and Debbie and Graham and Margo because no let me know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like I I have this whole like dream dream casting thing, and you know, like uh, uh, so sometimes when I w- in my mind, I'm like, ooh, who 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 could pull that off? But um, thank you so much for chatting with us. You, you are a delight as always. Um, hello to your horse. Um, who is who is outside? Yeah, who's wandering around right now, man? She's doing a facing. <laughs> She's a beautiful, beautiful. horse. And um, have a wonderful day. So we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.